Welcome to the River Online Sermon. I just want to make sure that you know that uh, um, this Christmas time, we're going to actually be having a Christmas Eve service on Saturday rather than um, having a Christmas service on Sunday morning. Um, so we'll be meeting on the 24th in the evening, um, not on the morning of the 25th. And just want to make sure that you know that you can get more information on our website if you're interested, um, but uh, and for or our Facebook page. Um, but just want to make sure that 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 is uh, known. Uh, let me pray for our time together as we get started. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this time uh, to be together. I thank you for this platform and the opportunity to dig into your word. I pray that you would be glorified in this message and this um, that this would go well and that you would help us to be open to the things you want us to see from your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So have you either read the book or seen the movie, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. So I've read the book and seen the movie multiple times. And in case you haven't, it's about some children from England who travel through the, the back of a wardrobe into another world called Narnia. And when they arrive, they find that it is, rap, it is trapped um, by an evil queen who has placed a spell over the land so that it is always winter, yet never Christmas. Now, I don't want to give away the story, but when the hero Aslan, the great lion, shows up, things begin to change, and the snow uh, begins to melt, and the land begins to be transformed from a cold, snowy wasteland into a blossoming, a blossoming majestic paradise. And I enjoyed that part of the story, but it wasn't until I moved to Minnesota that I really began to understand it on a different level. So I had always lived in places that had winter and snow, but typically that season was relatively short, and even the snowy and cold times we had didn't really last. But I remember one of our first winters here, we got hit with snow early, and the temperature dropped, and we basically lived in a winter wonderland for months, and it began to feel like it would never become spring. And then all of a sudden, things warmed up. And I remember being in my backyard and actually seeing little streams of water being carved uh, like carving their way through the inches of frozen snow and ice in my backyard and 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 the trees began to bloom as spring finally arrived. Now since being in Minnesota, I have a new pre appreciation for what Narnia was going through. Well today, we're going to take a look at an even more impressive transformation in nature. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah chapter 35. Now today we continue our Advent series with a look at another passage from the book of Isaiah. It's our Advent scripture reading uh, for the day and it, was, it fits well with what we talked about last week. So if you missed last week's message, you can go back and find it on our YouTube channel if you're interested. Now, part of my sermon prep includes digging through commentaries in, in the Crown College Library to see if, um, you know, like what other people are saying about the passage that we're, the passage we're going to talk about. And this week, one of the commentaries that I read was Gebline's Expositor's Bible Commentary, and they had a really interesting opening sentence for their section on this chapter of Isaiah. They wrote, Exalted passages of Scripture often suffer at the hands of their readers because they tend not to be read in their contexts. Now, the commentary then went on to point the reader back to the previous chapter of Isaiah. Actually, most, if not all, the commentaries that I read began with similar suggestions, pointing out uh, how this chapter is tied with chapter 34. So before we read 35, if you have your Bibles out, you can flip back one page or one screen uh, on your phones and take a look at um, Isaiah 34 for just a moment. In that chapter, we find judgment pronounced on the nations. Let me read just a few verses. For the Lord is enraged against all nations and furious against all their host. He has devoted them to destruction and has given them over for slaughter. Their slain shall be cast out and the stench of their corpses shall rise. The mountains shall flow with their blood. The Lord has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the cause of Zion. And the streams of Edom shall be turned into pitch and her soil into sulfur. Her land shall become burning pitch. Night and day it shall not be quenched. Its smoke shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Thorns shall grow over its strongholds, nettles and thistles in its fortress. It shall be the haunt of jackals and abode for ostriches. Now, I don't fully understand the ostrich reference there, but the focus in chapter 34 is all about judgment for the nations, vengeance from the Lord. It speaks of desolation and the land being transformed into a wasteland. Keep that image in mind as we then see a contrast in chapter 35. Let's pick things up with verse 1. 
The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. So first of all, what do you picture with these words, wilderness, dry land, and desert? Well, the words used in verse 1 all speak of the kind of the same idea, a desert or dry and barren place. I tend to picture a place that is arid, empty, and lonely, with the sun beating down, maybe the bones of animals on the ground and buzzards circling. But verse 1 speaks of this dry land being glad, rejoicing and blossoming like the crocus. What does that mean? So this is an anthropomorphism, which simply means to ascribe human attributes, traits, or emotions to inanimate objects. That's what we see happening in verse 1. The, the idea that the land becomes happy and rejoices is basically about the dry and barren land blossoming into a paradise. Verse 2 specifically mentions the glory of Lebanon and the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. Do you know what that's talking about? Well, Lebanon was a mountain area known for its beautiful, majestic cedar trees, and Carmel, likewise, was an area full of trees that was considered beautiful, and Sharon was made up of, of a fertile pasture land. Um, overall, it's conveying the idea of a barren, dry, desert land being transformed into a majestic, lush, beautiful place. And then that's connected with seeing the glory and majesty of the Lord. When contrasted with what we read in chapter 34, this really provides a strong contrast from the wasteland of 34 to the lush, majestic paradise of 35. Let's keep going, picking things up with verse 3. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. So what are these verses talking about? Well, this is speaking specifically to those who are afraid or maybe discouraged, even to the extent that they are worn out, exhausted, in danger of giving up the end of, of their rope. They're words of encouragement and strength to continue on and not give up. These verses hold that image of helping someone that is weak to become strong and helping the, uh, to calm the anxious heart. So why? Why should these words help? Well, verse 4 says, because God is coming to save them. Knowing that God is coming to save can strengthen weak knees and feeble heart, or feeble hands and calm the anxious heart, right? But how does that fit in with the previous couple of verses? Well, I think overall, these first four verses together speak of salvation, restoration, and transformation. Goodness coming for those who are in the midst of a wilderness or despair, anxiety, or um, when God comes, he will bring salvation, transformation, restoration, and goodness. Let's keep that in mind as we continue on picking this up with verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf, deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. Verses 5 and 6 speak of physical healings taking place. Blind eyes being opened, deaf ears unstopped, the lame being able to not just walk but leap, and the mute not only being um, able to speak but to sing. So what do you think of this image? Well, so these are words of hope and joy. A powerful image for us. Imagine a place where all kinds of people with obvious physical needs are, uh, are healed, where people are seeing, hearing, leaping, and singing for the first time. What an amazing image of healing and restoration for people. Actually, Jesus seems to refer to these verses in Luke 7 when John the Baptist sends some of his followers to ask if, if he is the one that they've been waiting for. And he says, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, the poor of good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Jesus, when he came, did these things we see in verses 5 and 6. And then the end of verse 6 goes back to talk about the land with streams even breaking out in the desert. Imagine what a transformation that would be. There's even an interesting phrase in verse 7 about the burning sand transformed into a pool. Did you know that the word there translated as burning sand, while it means parched ground or, or heat, it, it comes from a root word that means a glare or quivering glow and suggests what we would call a mirage, where the heat on the sand in the desert creates this refraction of light that causes us to see a pool of water where there is none. That suggests to me, not only that is the desert a, a, a place of parched ground that is hot because the sun is beating down upon it, but that is a, that this is speaking of a place that even teases the eye or mind into thinking that there is a pool of water that is not really there, like a mirage. How devastating that would be. But in these verses, that burning sand mirage is transformed into a real pool of water. 
and the thirsty land is transformed into a fountain. It seems like this incredible image of it, uh, like way better even than the, the, the scene from Narnia with the, the snow melting. This is like a desert place all of a sudden becoming fertile and fruitful. Actually, these verses fit really well with what we were talking about last Sunday. If you remember last week's passage from Isaiah 11, talked about the transformation in the natural world uh, where predatory animals became friends with their prey rather than eating them, and little children could play with snakes without being afraid of getting bit. And we talked about how the world itself is waiting for that day when Christ will return and restore all that is broken. These verses continue the idea of restoration. And look at what comes next, picking this up with verse 8. And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So in verse 8, we read about a highway. So what do you think about this highway? Well, first of all, they obviously didn't have our kind of highways back in Isaiah's time. So they would have envisioned something a little bit different than what we think of today. But it still would have carried the idea of a, a way that was cleared for people to travel in safety and ease. And notice, it will be called the way of holiness. What do you think of that name? Well, this is a reference to those who would use it. The highway would be for God's redeemed people, a highway where nothing unclean would reside, where even a fool will not get lost and where there will be no danger from any beast. Verses 9 and 10 specifically use two words to mention those who will travel there, calling them redeemed and ransom. What do you think of those words? The Hebrew word redeemed means avenged, delivered, purchased, or to act as a kinsman. And it would have carried with it the idea of the Old Testament kinsman redeemer who would have been the next of kin who would step in to avenge a relative or provide for them in some way. It's also a word that, would have, that was used to speak of the people being delivered out of their slavery in Egypt. The word ransom was similar and meant the means to redeem or the redemption price or the idea of delivered or re released or rescued. It also was a word that was used to speak of the people being brought out of Egypt again. With beautiful and powerful words, the way of holiness would be a place set aside for those who had been redeemed and ransomed to return to Zion, which is a reference to the mountain where Jerusalem was located. And we get this beautiful image of them returning to Jerusalem on this highway, singing and rejoicing. It's an image of joy and gladness. So overall, this is a really interesting chapter from Isaiah, but let me ask you, what does it mean for us? What are we supposed to take from this chapter, especially in the midst of this Advent season? Well, this week for Advent, the theme is joy. Actually, you will notice if you look at the Advent wreath, there's one specific candle that is different than the others. It is pink. And that candle is called the joy candle. It, it is lit on the third Sunday of Advent, which is also known as Gaudet Sunday, which comes from the Latin word for rejoice. Joy is a word that is very much associated with Christmas, right? It's like everything changes for a little bit and people are expected to be joyful. I mean, think about the story, A Christmas Carol. Ebenezer Scrooge was all bah humbug, but then after a visit from the ghost of Christmas past, present, and future, he was transformed into this joyful, Christmas-loving philanthropist. It's like, that's the expectation. During this season, we put up Christmas lights and other decorations. We throw parties and give gifts and sing Christmas carols and listen to joyful Christmas music and watch sappy or silly Christmas movies, and everyone is expected to be full of joy. You know, the other day I was sitting in the library at Crown College and a group of carolers from student development came through singing songs, wearing Santa hats and other Christmas clothing and handing out treats. When else does that happen? And then a little while later, someone uh, in one of the back offices was quietly humming Christmas carols. And I was thinking, this is a special time of year. But for many, it's all just a facade. And if we peek behind the curtain, we will see that life is still maybe a desert or a wilderness. Life isn't always joyful and no amount of presents or carols or Christmas lights or parties is gonna fix it. It's nothing more than a temporary respite. Unless we recognize what the Advent season is really all about. In Luke 2, when the angel appeared to the shepherds and to announce, to announce the birth of Jesus, he said, fear not for behold, I bring you the." Good news of great joy that will be for all the people. 
For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That's what we are really celebrating at Christmas. Joy to the world is not about a temporary facade of joy that is based on a few weeks of putting aside our troubles and cares, but joy that a Savior has been born who will save us from our sins and restore our relationship with our Creator with the eternal hope that one day we will be with Him forever in paradise. And knowing that, allows our weak hands and knees to be strengthened and our anxious hearts to be calmed as we walk through this broken world, this desert wilderness, awaiting the transformation, knowing that our God is coming when everything will be made right. And in this Advent season, we're reminded of that as we look back and remember the birth of our Savior and remind ourselves that he is not finished yet. He is coming again. And when he comes, he will bring restoration and transformation and our joy will be made complete. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for your goodness and grace. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you have come and that you are coming again. Help us to remember that this Advent. May you strengthen our weak hands and our feeble knees and our calm our anxious hearts as we wait upon you. In Jesus' name, amen.